morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Thanks for coming out to be with us this morning. We are glad that you're here. If you're a guest, welcome. And if you're a member, you're expected. So. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can uh, take that out and fill it out, place it in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later in our service. We're just glad you're here. If you have a prayer request, indicate that on the prayer card and we'll, we'll be praying about those tomorrow. So we're going to start things a little differently this morning. For one thing, Lincoln Smith, our regular, I started to say our normal worship leader, but that wouldn't be right, our regular <laughs> worship leader, he and Amy are out of town on some, some pleasant family business. And so we have Brad Bass, who's going to lead us this morning. He's a normal worship leader, so I'm glad to have Brad. And then... Um, the other thing that's different about how we're starting this morning is we are going to witness a baptism. Uh, Sean and Jackie Kelly's daughter, Caitlin, has been thinking about this for some time now. She's been raised up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as the scripture talks about. And she wants to give her life to Christ in baptism. And so we're going to witness that this morning. And if this raises any questions at all for you, we would love to talk about that because uh, we, as we read scripture, we just can't get away from how important baptism is. So raises a question for you, love to talk about it, but we're going to witness this right now. So um, for fathers who have done this before, you can sympathize. I'm going to try to get through this. Um, as you guys all as parents remember your kids when growing up, there's a day when they go, when can I be baptized? Or when am I going to be baptized? And you start asking questions, then it starts a conversation. And then the questions start coming a little more often. When is it going to be my turn? And eventually the day comes when it's, Sorry. I'm ready to be baptized. I'm ready for Jesus to be in my heart. And Caitlin has been asking those questions for, for probably about a year, two years. A couple... A couple weeks ago, she said, Mom, Dad, I'm, I'm ready. I want Jesus in my heart. And so we talked a little bit more about what that meant. We talked about how, as parents, we get to witness great things. Um, the birth, you know, the first steps, first words. Um, but when it comes down to it, this is the most important day. This is the most important decision that you can make. Because... It takes away all the guilt, all the sin. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Okay. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came to this earth to live a human life? Yes. Do you believe that he was crucified on the cross? But most importantly, do you believe that he rose on the third day and that resurrection was to save us from our sins? Yes. Okay. With that confession... I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Sing, choirs of angels, sing in exultation, O sing, all ye citizens of heaven.
Welcome. Welcome. Uh, say hey to somebody around you real quick and we'll figure out where I'm supposed to go from here. season of thanksgiving and uh, the remembrance of your, the birth of your son, we are just so grateful and so thankful. And uh, as we take this offering, um, allow us to give with grateful hearts and uh, just, to, just to attempt to say thank you. And, uh, in, in your son's name we pray. Amen. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our Thank you. 
Nothing gives a kid more joy than telling their parent to sit down. Uh, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. The Jewish world had been waiting for a very long time for a new king to come to ascend to David's throne. They were expecting a military leader who was going to... Uh, restored the prominence of Israel as a mighty power. They certainly were not expecting a poor carpenter with a bunch of misfit followers to be the coming Messiah. They couldn't deny that he was a prophet, but there was no way they thought that he could be the, the Messiah that they were expecting. The Romans saw him as just another rabbi. He had a small group of followers, but he was certainly not a threat. Pilate was so unconcerned that he was going to release Jesus. But he allowed the crowd to prevail with their shouts of crucifying, of crucify him, and he turned Jesus over to the soldiers to carry out the sentence. The soldiers themselves saw him as an object of ridicule, someone to be mocked, not feared. The very idea that he was a king who should be considered a threat seemed absurd. They amused themselves by beating him and mocking him. One very visible and memorable symbol of that mockery was a crown of thorns. Long, sharp thorns woven together in the shape of a crown to be forced on his head, intended to cause pain as they mocked his kingship. It was, demonstrated of, it was a demonstration of what they thought was their power and dominance, a crown that only caused pain. They could not see that the blood that flowed from the puncture wounds of the thorns was, a very, was the very purpose of this entire event. That blood was the sacrifice that would begin the establishment of a spiritual kingdom that would dominate the world and last forever. That crown of mockery helped establish a spiritual kingdom that would bring the opportunity for salvation to all men. The sacrifice of his body and his blood is still celebrated today. As we take this communion, we can truly say joy to the world. Let's bow, please. Our Father, we thank you for this bread. We thank you for the crown of thorns. We thank you for the crucifixion because it, it led to our salvation. God, we are totally in your debt and we will never be free from our obligation to you because we don't want to be free, Lord. We are thankful that you have brought us to you and we are thankful that we can serve Jesus and that we will have a home in heaven with you forever. And it's all because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And now as we take this bread, Lord, we pray that you will help us to take it with the full knowledge of what it means and that we will offer you our praise and honor and glory for as long as we live. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Give thanks for the cup. Holy Father, we're thankful for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. We're thankful for that this cup is, in, is a reminder of that blood every Sunday. And we thank you for this opportunity to share it together as we join together now in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in Nothing compares to the promise I have Got a new quarterback, and so um, <laughs> I want to pray. Let's pray. God, thank you for your majesty and your awe and your power and the inexplicable creativity it took to squeeze all of that into a tiny baby so that you could come and live among us. Not so that you could know us, as you already did, but so that we could know you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Brad, great job this morning. Thank you. Hey, I want to do a couple of program notes here before we get into the message, which is going to be from Matthew chapter 2, if you want to go ahead and turn to the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 2. When I first came here, they said, ooh, you'll love this, because every other year we have a Christmas play. And I was like, that's great, because I've never been a big fan of church Christmas plays, okay? I said it, there it is. It's out there, okay? I never was a fan of church Christmas plays. And then I went to ours, and I was blown away. It was really, really good. And so I've been looking forward to every other year that we have those, and this year, we have it again, and the title of this year's Christmas play is The Good, The Bad, and The Unimaginable. Let's all do it together. Okay? Can't wait to see what they're going to do with that. But the tickets are on sale now. Uh, the play is December 14th and 15th at 7 p.m. It's $5 for adults, $2 for children under 12. And here's the thing. This would be a great opportunity for you to invite a friend and here's how you do it. Our church is having a Christmas play, and our preacher said to invite somebody and really under, tell them you'll buy them dinner, all right? And then bring them, and then they'll be blown away, okay? This will be a good thing. It's, it's awesome. I want you to come be a part of that. So check that out. Oh, let me give you one other thing, too. Um, you, uh, yesterday, the, uh, our, st our crew was over here, the Christmas play crew building the sets, so the building was very busy. And I know they were here because I was here because we used our building to host a family that lost a loved one. Uh, it's actually a, a lady who was a member here. She's a really new member named Brenda Neal. And Brenda usually sat right over in here somewhere. And uh, Brenda passed away rather unexpectedly. We, we knew that she had some health problems, but she went in for a procedure uh, through a blood clot and passed away. And her family looked to us to help out. And so we did. And as it turns out, there were uh, about 100 of them that came by here for lunch. And they, they prepared a lot of the food. We prepared some of the food. But I want to give a shout out to Shannon Bridges and Leanne Herring because they were here all day and really <laughs> blessed that family and put a real smile on the face of this church. And you did too because... We used this facility, we used downstairs, and they were so grateful that, w that we showed them that hospitality. So thank Shannon and Leanne and you guys too. Look, when we give on Sundays, it, just, it doesn't go just for whatever. It goes for specific things that blesses people, and that blessed people yesterday. So it was a good day, good day yesterday. And we'll have a good one today too. So last week, we talked about how children are incessant question askers. Um, that British study I mentioned found that children will ask on average 73 questions a day, uh, which is exhausting for parents. And apparently, Jesus thought questions were pretty important too because he asked uh, a lot of them. 
in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about, uh, about 300 questions. And if you missed last week's message, you can go back and check it out. The question that we put out there last week was, who or what, who is or was Jesus Christ? Who is or was Jesus Christ? And that question's powerful because it confronts you with your freedom to decide whether he is an is or a was. And then once you answer that, you got to do something with it. But that was what we looked at last week. Go back and check it out online. You can find that. Here's the other thing children do. When they hear a story, they never just hear it. They, they want to live it. They want to try it on for size. That's why children will dress up like the characters in the story that they hear or see. So they'll hear a story and they'll put on some two big boots and stomp around the house like a cowboy for a day. Or they'll drape a towel around their shoulders for a cape and they're a superhero. Or they'll pin a, a tiara in their hair and their princess and they'll order all the other children to kneel because what else does one do in the presence of royalty, right? So children just kind of live these stories out. Um, to a child, a story is not just about what happened. It's about what might happen. It's a, a story is like a promise that how things are is not how things have to stay. That's kind of a neat way to live your life. Um, Jesus kind of liked stories too. He liked questions. He liked stories. So he told about 50 of them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I think he would agree with children that stories uh, are a really good way to find out who you are, good way to find out where you are, and a good way to find out who you can become. And I think his followers followed suit because they told a lot of stories too. Last week we were in Matthew chapter 1, the, as, as Matthew begins to tell us this story, but I don't think he's just telling us what happened any more than Jesus was just telling us what happened when he told stories. I think Matthew is prompting us to try on this story for size, to see if it fits, to see who we are, where we are, maybe even to see who we can become. So I want to get back into that this morning. In the, so far, in the first part of Matthew's story, We've not seen a lot of action. Uh, we haven't heard any dialogue. It, it's just narration. Joseph, the adoptive father of Jesus, uh, has not been given a speaking line yet. Uh, he's very present in the narrative. I mean, he's doing things, but he never says a word. He just does what he's told. Here's a spoiler alert. That won't change. Neither here in Matthew nor in the other telling of Jesus' birth in Luke's gospel, Joseph never speaks a word. He is the ultimate strong, silent type. And so right now, just then, somebody got elbowed and somebody whispered, why don't you try that on for size and see how it works? So, so Joseph gets nothing. You would, you would think that Mary would really be featured. Uh, in Luke's gospel, which is kind of like a musical, Mary gets this big solo. Uh, and you can read that in Luke chapter two, and sometimes we even sing Mary's song. But in Matthew's story, she kind of stands over here at the edge of the stage and doesn't get much attention at all in Matthew. The really weird thing is that Jesus, who's like the main character. He's the, the child of promise. I mean, the, the centuries old prom, promises, prophecies are, are about him. He's, he's barely mentioned. All Matthew tells us is she, Mary, gave birth to a son and he, Joseph, gave him the name Jesus. And that's the end of Matthew chapter one. Or I like to call it Matthew scene one. But when you get to chapter two, you get to Matthew scene two. The stage is suddenly flooded with very active 
very vocal characters. I just, I just want to read the first 12 verses in Matthew chapter 2. And, I, and remember, Matthew's not just saying, you know, here's what happened. Matthew is inviting us to ask, who, who am I in this story? Who can I become? Let's hear it. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, see the stage filling up? You've got the Magi, you've got Herod, you've got all Jerusalem, and you've got the chief priests. They're all crowded onto the stage here. So when he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. This is what was promised. Remember last week we talked about how prophecy was really a promise? This is what was promised. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod called, to get, called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him, and they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. God never gets old. So did you see yourself somewhere on that stage? Is there some character in that story you'd like to try on to see how it fits. Maybe you're drawn to the Magi. Maybe they take up a lot of space in this narrative. They've been the subject of debate for centuries. Some people say that there were only three. And that's kind of traditional in the West, right? Because of the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, one Magi to carry each gift. Others say that there were as many as 12 Matthew doesn't tell us how many. The Bible's silent about that. Tradition has always assumed, too, that the Magi were men. But the Bible is silent about their sex. Matthew uses the exotic term Magi. Of course, if they had been women, they would have asked directions, arrived on time, brought food, and helped deliver the baby, right? So the men didn't laugh at that. We don't know a lot about the Magi. We don't even know what nationality they were. A lot of people say they were from Persia. Here's the thing about Persians. When the Persians would conquer a country, they would take the best and brightest, and they would bring them to their country, and then they would train them in their culture, and then they would take the best and brightest of those, and those would become advisors to the king. Remember the story of Daniel? Daniel in the lion's den? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were Hebrews who were advisors to a foreign king. So we have no idea who the Magi were, where they were from, what color their skin was, the shape of their eyes, their gender. We know nothing at all about them except they wanted to see Jesus. That's all we know. Now, most everybody agrees they traveled a long, long way, maybe as, from as far away is Babylon. That would have been about a 900-mile journey. When the prophet Ezra made that trek in the Old Testament, it took him four months. So it was a long way. And regardless of how many magi there were, whether there were three or 12 or 24, 
there would have been a very large entourage with them. They would have had, a, they would have had attendants, they would have had porters, they would have had guards because they were, after all, carrying gold. So when they pulled into Jerusalem, they would have made an impression. Everybody would have noticed and wondered. So why did the Magi come? Why did they mount this expedition? Matthew says they saw the star, but that's really an answer to the question, where, not why. And they told Herod they'd come to worship, but that's, that's an answer to the question, what? Why did they follow the star? Why did they come to worship? You ever heard of a first century Roman historian named Suetonius? His full name was Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, which is a wonderful name. Perhaps you should name your child that. Most boys in the next nine months are going to be named Jalen, but that's another story. <laughs> Suetonius is famous for his work, The Twelve Caesars. And, and what he did is he, is he wrote the biographies of the first 12 Caesars in Rome. And, and as he chronicles the lives of Rome's leaders, he often refers to Christians. And in one of his works about Augustus Caesar, he writes, quote, there was an old and persistent belief destiny had decreed that at that time, during the time of Augustus, men coming from Judea would seize power and rule the world. There was an expectation that a king would be born in Judea. The, the prophecy, the promise that the chief priests told Herod about, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler. That they, they knew it. Suetonius knew it. And the Magi must have known it. Expectation. That's why they came. You gotta wonder. In their exotic homeland, did, did, did they hear some old... Hebrew exile, some old Hebrew refugee, tell a story about a king who would become more than a tyrant or a despot or a dictator. He would be a shepherd. Did they hear that old Hebrew tell the story that this king that would be a shepherd would be born in, a, in an obscure little town in Judea? Did they hear the old Hebrew recite Numbers 24, I see him but not now? I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Judah. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Expectation. It's what you feel when a promise is made. Expectation that how things are is not how things have to stay. That who you are is not who you always have to be. That the story of your life can take a turn. That life can be richer. That relationships can go deeper. That your marriage can be more than a parenting partnership or a financial arrangement. That you can be more than you are. So like the Magi, you don't know exactly how to make that happen. But you know it has to have something to do with Jesus. That's one of the reasons the Magi are such compelling characters. You, you know they weren't members of the Church of Christ, right? They weren't Baptist. They, they weren't Jews. They probably weren't even monotheists, people who believe in the one true God. They were just curious they, and, and expectant and willing to take a long journey to take a look. Inquisitive, expectant, hopeful. If you're looking for a story to try on for size, that's a good story. You could do a lot worse than the Magi. You could be the chief priests, for example. They're the ones Herod called to find out where the promised Messiah was to be born. And they knew the answer. Bethlehem. They quoted it right out of the Old Testament prophet Micah. Of course they knew. That was their job. They were the keepers of Israel's story. 
They were the Bible scholars. If these guys had appeared on Jeopardy and the category Old Testament minutiae came up, they would have run the board. They were the ministers charged with representing God to the people and the people to God. They practically lived in the temple. And yet, when a caravan of Eastern mystics rolls into Jerusalem asking questions about a newborn king of the Jews, when King Herod himself calls them in for an emergency confab to ask questions about the Messiah, they just sort of shrug. You know what the chief priests are like? They're like people who got tomorrow's paper today and read what the winning lottery numbers are going to be and didn't buy a ticket. They knew and didn't do anything about it. I wondered about this when I was going back through this story this week. Did they not see the star? Did they not see the star because they weren't looking for it? They weren't expecting God to do anything? Or did they not see the star because God didn't let them see it? Didn't show it to them because he knew their hearts. See, the Magi, when you, when you read these guys in Matthew chapter 1, the Magi are uninformed, but expectant. God can work with that. So if that's where you are, if that's your story right now, you have this sense that something could be better in your life and you think it probably has something to do with Jesus, but you just don't know a lot about it, God can work with that all day long. They were expectant, but uninformed, the Magi. But the chief priests, they were informed, but apathetic. I'm not sure God can work with that. And nobody who has been in, read around in the New Testament even a little wants to be like them. But here's the thing, and this is where my sermon stepped on my own toes. Sometimes I see some of them in me. Maybe you see them in you too. Because if we're honest, we do pretty well with Bible trivia ourselves. We know this thing pretty well. And the danger for people like you and like me is that the story of what God has done in Jesus can become really routine, boring. We can become unmoved by it. C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if it's true, it is of infinite importance. The one thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. And then there's Herod. You've got the Magi, you've got the chief priests, and you've got Herod. Now, you may be surprised to hear me say this, but of all the characters in Matthew's story, Herod gets it. By the time Jesus was born, Herod was 75 years old. He had married 10 different women, had a whole lot of children. He had killed one of his wives, had her executed, and killed two of his sons because they represented a threat to his throne. He'd also imprisoned a whole bunch of other family members. He was not a nice man. So when the Magi show up with their star talk and questions about a king, Herod manages to achieve something the chief priests don't, an honest reaction. He is disturbed, Matthew says. And why? Because Herod knows that a king, especially one who seems to fulfill the ancient promises, even if you don't believe the promises, this guy seems to fulfill that. He seems to measure up to that. He seems to fit the profile. Herod knows this guy represents an existential threat to his power. Next week, we'll see the lengths to which he is willing to go to protect that power. But think about it this way. If a man is willing to kill his own sons... Nobody's sons are safe, which is probably why Matthew reports that when Herod was disturbed, all Jerusalem was disturbed with him. They all held their children a little tighter. See, Herod is one of those villains that everybody loves to hate. He's easy to hate. 
He has absolutely no redeeming qualities. Even other villains didn't like Herod. Caesar Augustus once remarked that it would be safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's progeny. But it is wise for us to slow walk our condemnation of Herod. Because if you look closely and honestly, I think maybe we can see a little bit of Herod in ourselves too. See, inside every one of us, there's a throne. And every day, we have to decide who is going to sit on it. And there are only two rivals. It's not Satan and Jesus. It's self and Jesus. See, if I put myself on the throne, which I really like to do, and that's an honest confession, I love to run my own life. Truth is, I'd kind of like to run yours, okay? Just to be, if we're being honest here, if we're just being honest, I'd like to run my own life and I'd like to tell you what to do. But if, if I put myself on the throne, then I, I get to dictate the direction my life takes. I get to decide how I make and how I spend my money. I get to decide what I do with my time. I get to decide how I treat other people. It's my decision. I get to decide where I use my talents. I get to decide what I do with my body. Nobody can tell me what to do with my body. I get to decide all of those things for me because I am the one sitting on that throne. But if I put Jesus on that throne, then he gets to make all those decisions. My role and yours is to obey, and that's a thing we struggle with. We struggle with, we struggle with that all our lives. As children, here's what we would say when an older sibling or a bigger kid would, would, would try to tell us what to do, we'd say, you're not the boss of me. You're not the boss of me. And we didn't outgrow it. We didn't outgrow our aversion to being told what to do because then we had, we became teenagers and we rebelled against our parents. When I was growing up, you grew your hair long and you listened to the Beatles, okay? I don't know what it is for you guys, but do you find some way to rebel against authority because you, you don't like it, none of us like it. And as adults, we still don't outgrow it. We resent people telling us what to do. We, we, we bristle if somebody infringes on our rights or challenges our autonomy or stands in the way of how we express our personal freedom. If we were honest in this country, we would take in God we trust off our money and replace it with, you can't tell me what to do. Herod got that. Herod understood better than anybody else in that story what the birth of Jesus meant. And deep down, I bet everybody in this room understands what it means too. So what's your story? You more like the Magi, expectant but uninformed? Like there's got to be something better out there and you suspect it might have something to do with Jesus, you just don't have enough information. You need to know more of the story. If that's where you are, keep asking questions. Jesus once said that those who seek will find. That's a promise. Or maybe, maybe you got really uncomfortable when we talked about the chief priests. That's the part that made me uncomfortable. The tendency to be fully informed, but a little apathetic. When the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ doesn't move me the way it should, I have found that it helps me to spend time with new Christians or children. Their wonder, their enthusiasm is contagious and convicting. Or maybe you're more like Herod than you'd like to admit. Empowered, but insecure. Do you remember the movie Elf? Remember the movie Elf where Buddy is in the mall, right? And he sees this Santa and he gets really excited. And then he realizes this is not a real Santa. What's the line? You want to say it with me? You sit on a throne of lies. (laughs) 
You and I are not buddy. We're that fake Santa. We are not the real deal. We are no more equipped to run our own lives than a toddler is the space shuttle. And one way we, some of the staff were talking about this last week, and, and Caleb Gendron, one of our youth ministers, had a really great comment. We were talking about this part. He said, one way or another, Jesus will dismantle every throne we sit on. One way or another, Jesus will dismantle the throne we sit on. Here's the good news. If you're in a story right now that you don't, you know you shouldn't be in, here's the good news. And it comes, it's articulated this time by a man named Mo Willems. Never met the guy, wasn't even aware of him until I ran across this this past week, but he wrote a book with an intriguing title. I haven't read it, but I must. The title of the book is Goldilocks and the Three Dinosaurs. I got to read that. Here's how he puts it. If you find yourself in the wrong story, leave. Jesus came to give us a way out of the wrong story and a way in to the right story. That's good news. All morning long, we've been singing about kings, about Jesus being the king and the ruler. And we're going to end this morning by singing, who is this king? It's a good question. Let's stand. Let's ask it of ourselves. Be beautiful and matchless one. Who is this king so holy? Every knee will bow and scroll. Some family news here. Here we go. Uh, if you're a new member or you are thinking about 
making Twickenham your church home. Next Sunday, the 9th, uh, we have a, a new member's lunch, and that's an inquirer's lunch, if you'd like for it to be. And our elders and staff will be there, and you can ask us questions, and we'll tell you what we know. And the lunch is free, so you should come join us for that. Um, there's a hat and glove drive going on right now for kids at Chaffee Elementary. You can bring hats and gloves uh, to our gym and the children's lobby downstairs uh, between now and Sunday, December 16th. I mentioned the Christmas play. Tickets for that are on sale right out these doors. And then this Thursday, our ladies are having, the women's ministry is having uh, their jingle and mingle. And there's a sign-up table in the gym lobby that's downstairs, right kind of down that way. Uh, you can sign up for that, and they, they would love for you to come and be a part of that. Also, don't forget to check out our uh, opportunities to serve uh, survey online. Go online and fill that out and find a way you can use the gifts God has given you to put you to work. Brother, are you going to pray for us? Let's have a closing prayer. Hey, I'm really glad you were here this morning. Let's go out this week as we go. Let Jesus be the one who sits on that throne for you. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Father God, thank you for the story. Thank you for making your story our story. Father, help us to be like the Magi, inquisitive, expectant, and hopeful. As we depart from here, help us to be that to story to all those that we will come in contact with. We know that the story is to be told next door, down the street. Help us to be that story, to be inquisitive, expected, and hopeful to all that we run into. Very specifically as we close today, Father, thank you for a new life, Caitlin. We rejoice with Sean and Jackie. It was awesome to watch a new life emerge right before our very eyes. Father, we pray for the leaders at Twickenham. We pray for the elders and the ministers and their wives and the leaders and all of our ministry leaders and our administrators. Holy Spirit, give us discernment. Give us wisdom as we envision a future of telling the story here in Huntsville. Be with our world leaders Heavenly Father, uh, they, they really need it. We ask your wisdom and your discernment and all of our world leaders that you would indwell, that you would give us right actions, discerning and wise actions that protect this wonderful country. And be with our military, military men and women in uniform that risk their lives to make a difference to protect this wonderful, beautiful country you've given us. We pray for our widows and orphans that you would let us be the story to them. As we depart today, Father, thank you for the lesson. Help us to be the story. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen.